may I have your attention. Please welcome TechCrunch Managing Editor, Matt Burns. Wow, look at all these people out here. Oh my. Yes, this is great. This has been a fantastic week. I, I hope you guys have had a thrilling time. I know I have. I've been attending Disrupt since 2008, and this is the first time I got to host Start a Battlefield. And you guys have been a great audience. I hope I've been a decent host, so thank you very much. I wanted to start with that. Next, I want to recap what happened. Over the last two days, you saw 20 companies from the Battlefield 20%. They had six minutes to pitch, six minutes of question and answers. You know all that. Today, they have six minutes to pitch, nine minutes of question and answers, and the whole new panel of judges. These companies are competing for $100,000 and the Disrupt Cup. The judges are going to look at their potential for impact, and that can be either financially or socially. So when you're sitting there thinking, why did that, that company win this one didn't? That's what the judges are looking at. So I'd like you to look, look at the companies through that too. So with that said, I think we should just get started. We're going to bring out all the judges here. First up, oh, give them a big round of applause. Let's give them come up to some energy. First, we have Mar Hirsch Hirschensen. Mar is a co-founder and managing partner of Pair VC, a seed stage investment firm in Palo Alto, backing companies like Guardians Health, Gusto, and Branch. Prior to Par, prior to Pair, Mar co-founded three companies and held executive positions in product and engineering at Magma Design Automotion. Next, we have Jim Lanzone. Jim is the CEO of Yahoo and oversees a global media and tech company that reaches 900 million people around the wo world and is the third largest property on the internet. And he the CEO of TechCrunch too, is my boss is my boss's boss. He is a former CEO of Tinder, and prior to Tinder, Jim spent a decade as president and CEO of CBS Interactive. He joined CBS in 2011 when CBS Corporation purchased Clicker Media, and Clicker Media actually pitched here on this stage in 2009, but it didn't win though, did it? <laughs> it did not. Next, we have Aileen Lee. Aileen Lee is a founding partner at Cowboy Ventures, a team that backs seed stage technology companies reimagining work and life through technology. Cowboy Ventures works with a wide range of startups from modern enterprise oriented companies like Peel Education and Lightstep to new consumer digital native brands like Dollar Shave Club and Tally. Next, we have my boss, Matthew Panzerino. He joined TechCrunch <laughs> in 2013, became editor-in-chief in 2014, and that's the position he's held since. Next is David Tisch. David Tisch is the managing partner of Box Group, a New York City-based seed stage venture capital firm that has invested in over 400 seed stage startups. He is the co-founder of Techstars New York City and serves on the board of Friends of Hudson River Valley Park. Lastly, we have Rich Wong. Rich joined Excel as a partner in 2006. Rich led Excel's investment and currently serves on the boards of Atlassian, UiPath, Checker, and many more. I'm not gonna read the entire list here because there's a <laughs> lot. Rich also served on the National Venture Capital Association Board of Directors. Give him one more round of applause. <laughs> Lastly, I want to announce the five companies that are, that are selected as finalists. Presenting first will be I Advanced Ionics, followed by AppMap, Entropic Materials, Minerva Lithium, and lastly, Swap Robotics. They're ready over there, so let's get going. Advanced Ionics. From Milwaukee, Wisconsin, we have Advanced Ionics. Presenting for Advanced Ionics is Chad Mason, founder and CEO. Big round of applause. All right. So um, I was told you folks did not talk about hydrogen over happy hour quite as much last night as you were supposed to. So they brought me back so we can really uh -huh. kind of reemphasize it a bit here. So, you know... <laughs> Just a few more examples, you know, from yesterday about places where hydrogen is used in your daily life or things like your glassware, silverware, um, the oils in your cosmetics, and of course, the food and beverage I mentioned. So 90 plus percent of hydrogen today is used in just two things, and that's ammonia and petrochemicals. And so I like the ammonia example uh, the most because I grew up on a family farm in North Dakota 
and hydrogen is used to make ammonia, which is a fertilizer that's put down to help crops grow, like barley that goes in your beer. Um, and I used to drive equipment such as this as a, uh, as a kid, putting down this anhydrous ammonia. So it mattered a lot to me even then. And, you know, one of the things to know is these heavy industries like ammonia and petrochemicals, steel, cement, we often don't think about them a lot in the grand uh, scheme of decarbonization, but it's 30 plus percent of total emissions. So we have to decarbonize these industries and of course the hydrogen that underpins many of them. Now, I was hoping I wouldn't have to show this again, but you know, one more time, and maybe the <laughs> last time in my life. Um, so, uh, you know, here's me as an <laughs> irritable teenager um, getting a picture taken by my mom. So all those kids out there, do let your mom take a picture of you when you're working on cool stuff. Um, and so, you know, one thing I realized back then was that um, clean hydrogen can be made using a process called electrolysis. And so I started learning how to build electrolyzers from you know, tube and shell back then and trying to make stuff run on them. And one thing I really learned that is important for electrolysis, and it's still true today, is that electricity use limits electrolyzers. And even if your electrolyzer was free, um, electricity cost um, and the amount of it that you use just dominates so much. Um, and so, you know, basically that's why Advanced Ionics was founded, is to set the new standard for industrial electrolysis. Um, and we do that with breakthrough electrolyzers, reducing electricity requirements down to 35 kilowatt hours to make one kilogram of hydrogen. And we do this with what we call symbian cell technology, and it does what other electrolyzers can only dream of doing, eliminating the delicate membrane or brittle ceramics that are seen in every other technology. And what's amazing about this platform architecture is there's no expensive, rare materials that are used everywhere else, no toxic fluoropolymers or difficult to recycle chemicals. And then we do both the material side and the systems under one roof with our amazing team. So let's go to that team right now in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And we have Owen and James here who are going to um, handle the camera. So, these are some of our secret sauce, electrode assemblies and bipolar plates. So in the lower left, uh, you basically see what we started with, a button cell uh, that proved out our technology and the fact that it works really well. And then this year we've scaled that up 20X and are validating that right now internally. And then we've actually already scaled that, that up another 8X um, and we're gonna start validation on that early next year. On uh, the bipolar plates in the upper left there and then let's pan over to the left, Owen, and up. Okay, so all of these components go together and get put inside of a cell, which gets put into a stack, and this goes inside of this insulated box here, and that's where the magic happens. Steam is converted into hydrogen and oxygen at the highest efficiencies. And then down on the bottom is the rest of the cool balance of plant that just supports and keeps everything running nice and happy. So thanks a lot, Owen and James, and uh, let's go back to presentation. <laughs> um, yeah, so, you know, these systems are being built to have this synergy uh, with industry. And so for the first time, we're actually making electrolyzers that run at exactly the same temperatures as all of these heavy industrial processes, we, processes I talked about. And so it's really quite simple. Utilizing that heat allows you to significantly lower the amount of electricity you need. So, so there's that perfect synergy. And so we have really amazing customer traction. Of course, it's always a chicken and egg type thing with startups, hardware startups to prove it out, getting early partners. Um, and we do have some really wonderful partners we're working with to demonstrate it. Uh, chemicals and refinery uh, with a one kilogram per day demo, and then moving up to an energy services demo, and then on to my favorite, an ammonia demonstration. And we have even more in the pipeline. Uh, folks are already asking us for systems in the latter half of the decade. Um, so those demonstrations will happen in 23 and 24, early commercialization uh, in 25, and then the larger scale systems will be deployed starting in about 26 and 27 for that massive impact. Um, and so we want to and expect to have over 2 billion in cumulative sales booked by the year 2030, and more importantly, by the year 2050, abating over 10 gigatons of carbon emissions with just our technology alone having this big impact on the industry. And so that future will then finally be realized where we've replaced all that dirty fossil-based hydrogen production with clean, 
electrolyzers by our company for heavy industry. And that dream I had as a kid where, you know, we could make clean hydrogen for clean ammonia so people on farms such as my family's could grow clean, sustainable crops for everybody. And so come build this future with us. We have just an amazing team of crazy smart people um, that have great experience in heavy industry and service experience also. Um, so just come join us um, and be part of our mission to help decarbonize heavy industry. So thank you very much. Chad, good to see you again. Thanks. Mar, let's start with you. Awesome. Good job, Chad. Thanks. I mean, it looks like uh, hydrogen is coming up, so this is the right time for a product like this. Yeah. I'm curious how far we are from actually having this green hydrogen at a price that is competitive. Maybe you can tell yeah. us about it and what's the, you know, what do you need to prove to get to that? Yeah, so as you probably remember from the pie chart, OPEX, electricity price dominates. And so there's one thing under our control in our industry, and that's use less electricity. The other thing is really um, we're riding on the coattails of the amazing work that the solar, wind, and other clean energy industries have done. And they've been the ones who've been deploying and driving down the price of clean electricity for all of us. And so everything that plugs in and uses that electricity, just like electrolyzers, needs that cheap electricity from them. And so it's important we use as little of it as possible. So. How, how far are we, though? Like, you have to... You know, the green energy has to get cheap enough, and then yeah. you guys have, you know, what's... It's a big job. I mean, the, our entire industry um, has to scale up. Um, there's been, you know, what I've read recently is there's some forecasts that we have 10 times less electrolyzer um, production capacity worldwide than we're going to need to yeah. scale up this industry. And really, that's mirrored across many clean energy technologies, not just ourselves in the hydrogen industry. So we really need to get to deploying capital um, into companies like ourselves, but also a lot of other great companies to scale up this tech and start to have an impact. And we don't have any time. Chad, to, to follow up on, on Mars' question, so maybe can you just talk about the current price per kilogram of like kind of dirty hydrogen? Yeah. And then maybe like when you have your first plant, how much money do you think you'll need in terms of CapEx to build the first plant? And like what's your estimate about maybe if it is solar powered in a very low electricity location, like how much do you think it'll cost, per, like the price per kilogram will be? Yeah, yeah. Once we're scaled up a plant, uh, our costs will probably be, um, and it varies depending on the size, between three to ten million dollars, um, and that's our cost of goods sold, basically. Um, where hydrogen's at today, you know, the the situation in Russia has really, uh, in Ukraine, has really um, put a lot of flux into the market right now, and so it really varies wildly. And the prices that are often reported aren't always the same as what's on the books for a company. So, like even uh, prior decade in the Gulf Coast, you could make hydrogen for 30 cents a kilogram, dirty hydrogen. Um, but it costs a lot of money then if you sell it on the merchant market, and especially it's really bad if you have to compress it, store it, transport it, do all of those things. Um, and so to get to your point is that it's very geographically dependent. How much renewable energy do you have in a region? Um, and then, you know, how much other clean electricity do you have in that region? Um, so places like Chile, Australia have very high solar potential and other places are less good. So what about on like a per customer basis? Like how are you going to get this into the existing? And by the way, congratulations on how far you've come Thanks. from your raging party high school days. <laughs> yeah, it's you a can miracle tell. you've made it. Yeah, <laughs> I, know. Uh, I know. What? Uh, yeah. How do you how do you get it out there to the existing infrastructure from what you have? Yeah, yeah. So it, it really depends also um, where you're at and the type of customer. So. For example, European um, companies, even oil and gas, are, are starting to be very progressive, and they have to start to gradually decarbonize their operations. So we actually provide a real easy pathway for them where you can plug this system into a site and append it on to their existing hydrogen production, and they can immediately start to green uh, their hydrogen slowly and build up, and eventually that old steam methane reformer making dirty hydrogen can be fully replaced. Mm -hmm. Then for other folks, um, you're starting to see a lot of announcements in, you know, like Chile, India, Middle East, North Africa, Australia, where they're doing brand new build. Um, ammonia plants, methanol plants, clean steel plants like in Sweden. And so there's really good opportunities for us on both sides, both the retrofitting old and also helping new folks and new project developers deploy new greenfield builds. Chad, just to understand, is the manufacturer where you're siding the equipment naturally the consumer of it, or do you have to ever ship it off-site? 
or is it that's the place the hydrogens? Yeah, the large, usually it's the large producer of the chemical or the product that they buy the electrolyzer and then they, they source their clean electricity however they want. And most of these companies are very large. They have ways to source it themselves. Uh, what, go ahead, sorry. Go please. Maybe just a very quick follow-up. Um, to get your first 10 to 20 million of revenues, I mean, awesome to see the 2 billion uh, yeah. goal. How much capital do you think you're going to need to raise to, you know, to sort of put the equipment in place to, to get to that first several, well, ideally 10 million of revenue just to use that? Um, roughly, it'll be about, about 70, 80 million dollars, but I'm giving you very rough ballpark numbers. Hmm. Um, so. Great, uh, great job and, and sort of hope it works, right? Yeah, at, yeah. At the scale that, that you do. Um, taking a big step back, we just talk about hydrogen adoption yeah. and how your company either needs to educate the market yeah. and sort of what will cause industrial users to adopt hydrogen versus all the alternatives that they have. Yeah. And is that just a price equation game? Is that a distribution? Just sort of where does your company need to fit in the education and distribution of hydrogen versus alternatives? Yeah, I mean, it's important that, I mean, that you quickly transition as fast as possible. So, you know, to your point is government policy can really stimulate that. And I was talking about it yesterday about on the production side, the IRA bill has really stimulated uh, the production side, but not on the demand side in the US. Now, Europe is still doing a better job on the demand side where they're kind of forcing heavy industries to move to clean hydrogen as fast as possible. And, you know, kind of furthermore, you know, for, for the f industries I talked about, there is no alternative. They use hydrogen today because it's a critical feedstock for their process. So we need to decarbonize it as quickly are you, as possible. Are you dependent upon the government to no. educate or are you? It helps. You know, everybody, sure. <laughs> everybody has a role to play. I mean, even folks in the crowd who are just, you know, fans of, you know, clean tech, everybody has a role to play, uh, to push. And it's important we, re we really talk about the things that have to happen with decarbonizing heavy just, industry. Just pulling on this like a little more. Your company, how, how are you going to educate the market? Because that's expensive to teach people things. Yeah, well, thanks for having me here. That yeah. really helps a lot. <laughs> it's a really uh, amazing platform um, to have TechCrunch really embracing hardware and um, climate tech companies such as myself here. So uh, we're just going to keep doing as many events like this and make sure folks know about us and also prove out what we're doing and um, talk to government too. <laughs> Um, how do you, so let me ask a, um, a future question, assuming that the, you do reach scale. What's the maintenance and uh, follow-up look like on all these machines? Mm -hmm. Is that a job you see your company is doing, and do you view that as a revenue stream as well? Yeah, there's a couple ways we can do this, and actually customers have told us they want both methods. I mean, one is where um, you sell it, and then because they might need to rate base it if they're a utility. Um, and then there is some maintenance agreement afterwards. It, it wouldn't be significant. It'd be less than 5% of the total cost of the hydrogen. Um, and that's pretty standard across the entire industry. Um, we are gonna look at opportunities for leasing arrangements also, um, but later on when we, when we have some financial partners who can help facilitate that. Any last questions? Give them one more round of applause. Yeah. All right. Yeah.